All right, we're live with my homie Blair McGlory from back in the day, from elementary school. Oh, our man. old Boy. ring leader, um, yeah. Johnny Cervantes, set us both up, told him one thing, me another, and he set us up on a blind podcast. And here we are. <laughs> How you doing, Blair? Man, I'm doing great, man. It's so good to see your face, bro. It's been a hot minute. It's man. been a hot minute. For real, for real. Let's get this pandemic over and we got a link since we're still in LA. We got a link for real, for real, face to face. Can we, can we be done with this already? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the name of my podcast, if you haven't seen it yet, is the philosophy of art and science. And the basic idea is to just think critically as much as we can, you know, on all the most interesting subjects. And you've, you know, you've did a deep dive in your life through music. What what got you into music and tell folks like, you know, the levels of which, you know, you've you've been through from like yeah, young to man. old. That'd be awesome. So it started off, you know, my mom got me and my brother into like, you know, playing keyboard from like church, you know. Mm -hmm. And we found somebody at our church that was like, Hey, I want to teach your kids privately. Yeah. So we, I think I think it was probably around the time that we even met, like in kindergarten, dude. Like, uh, we, if I'm not mistaken, I, I came in second grade. So I came later. Oh, I used to be at a Montessori. Right. So you, you, Johnny, and Rastine would have met in kindergarten. Yeah. I think you were in Miss Chan's second grade with me, right? Yes, I was. So that's the class that all four of us had. Because I, I came in late. I was a late comer. I was supposed to be Miss Horiel's class for another year because she moved from doing first to second, and then my mom didn't like her, so she made me go to Miss Chan. Man, that's great! Like, look at that. That's providence right there. Yeah, for real. And dude. it's funny that you said you started off in church. I hear that from a lot of cats, right? Like the acapella singers that are with um, Anthony Hamilton that mm -hmm. sang that famous song about Birdman when he was on Breakfast Club. Like, yeah, a dude. lot of these cats they grow up there. Well, the crazy thing about church, and I feel like I shouldn't even like put that out there as if I I fully did because we weren't strong uh, learning music from church. To be honest, mm -hmm. a lot of my foundational music background comes from school, um, just being taught in the schools. But as a youngin, you know, probably from like first grade to fifth grade, that was mostly like a lot of uh, private piano teaching. My yeah. mom did hop me on a violin when I was in second grade, and I feel like she regretted it. <laughs> like, immediately. She's like, oh, he's going to be such a great violin player. And then she heard me practice, and she was like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> she didn't want to give you time with that? She was See, like, I did, man, I did a like year you, at a boy, keyboard like concept. <laughs> uh, I, I did a year at, at keyboard concepts. on a, It used to be on Burbank and Van Nuys. Oh, damn. And my okay. sister and I did that, but we went to Ethiopia one summer and my sister was like, yo, let's quit. And, you know, that was the time my parents would take me is Friday night and we weren't allowed to watch TV on weekdays. So that was my Dragon Ball Z slot. Oh, and I wasn't, hey, hey. I wasn't finna replace Dragon Ball Z. Not, I don't think any of us were, bro. <laughs> None of us were going to be doing that. Um, let me continue on the journey. Uh, sixth grade was uh, Milliken. Yeah, And I remember this is honestly where it really started to take off because the first semester um, as like a sixth grader walking into music, unless you were gifted, they were like, all right, you're in remedial <laughs> pretty much is what it is, which is basically learning and comprehending and understanding uh, music, like how to read it, how to actually do it, like how to rhythmically clap things in time and yada, yada. So by the end of that, there's this whole process where they're just like, all right, so, and this is, this is the messed up thing about band programs sometimes. If they don't have enough of something, they're going to throw you in it. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll be like, hey, we have way too many trumpet players, but we really need trombonists. So, like, I don't know what you thought you were going to be playing, but you're going to be playing trombone. And it's just like, <laughs> like, how does that work you know like you can't be doing that so what miss kang back in middle school shout out miss kang also r.i.p rest in peace mm -hmm. um she would give us choices so she'd be like here are all these categories that you can choose um go put your name where you want to be at and then you'll be tested i saw nobody pick tuba 
okay. my boy. I was supposed to play tuba, all right? Yeah. Because I was like, first off, that's the biggest instrument. It looks dope. It sounds awesome. Like, I can't wait to tell my mom. I got home, bro, and my mom was like, you want to play what? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I want to play tuba. Why do you want to play tuba? And this is a portion of myself, of, like, who I am kind of spilling out. I was like, well, nobody else was going to play tuba, so I wanted to help out and play tuba. And she goes, boy, you better turn around and go back to that class. <laughs> You are not playing tuba. It's like with Miss King, and I'm like, sorry, I can't play tuba. She's like, well, we'll give you a few other extra days to think about it. And I remember, I think it was on, do you remember like on like regular like cable TV, how there was that classical TV station? Um, it was like is it, between like the 20s and the 30s. Is it tied to the, the one from USC? I, KUSC? I think so. Yeah. Yes. I think then I yeah I think I think that's KUSC then yeah, which was tied to the radio uh, ninety one point five. Yes, thank you. Because I was sitting there, I was thinking about that for like a week or two ago. And I'm like, Dang. Yeah, I listened to it a lot. I was a Lyft driver for a couple years, and mm -hmm. I've tried so many different things. And outside of the Friday night Saturday night slot, which you know has to be kind of pop and pop and hip hop, yeah, totally. most most times cutting across most like demographics of, of people who are lift riders mm -hmm. classical music least likely to piss people off and gets oh, you totally. the highest ratings totally unless you just don't have an appreciation for just different stuff or you're just like a diehard one genre fan and they're just like oh my god why are we listening to classical <laughs> just like what you're on you're you're on your way to work why do you care you know like yeah but no, it's it's possible. universal. Go ahead, like go you ahead. have international cats who can't even speak English, mm -hmm. and you hear them humming along because they know that. Like yeah. some of them are probably you know trained in classical music. Well, you know, and they they know that. You know that in some areas of the world that like it's a requirement, mm -hmm. the teaching requirement to learn music and like learn music comprehension and to learn like basic keyboard and stuff. We don't have that. No. You know? So I'm not surprised that uh, people that are not from our country would come in and they would like know these students because they probably train them to have, you know, the ears for it and to actually comprehend like what this classical piece is, which I think is crazy and also think we should have that here. It would, it would have been nice, man. I got my music journey after that. Um, I got more involved in church after college. And so we have a drum. Uh, I, I don't know how best to describe it, but it's, it's a hand drum that's bigger on one side and smaller, smaller. It's like cylindric and it's smaller on the other side. And so you hit it on one hand on each side. It's called cabaro. Uh, okay. It's called the cabaro. And so I learned that. That took me like probably three years to where actually that, where that get down originated from like where is it from? in ethiopia okay. in ethiopia and then we have an an ancient instrument called the the sistrum which is like you, it's you hold it in your hands and it just kind of that's the like pretty much the only hey, um, okay. noise that it makes right and and then the rest is like all acapella so for the past what seven eight years I've been practicing those three things, like my acapella and then the other two. Mm. I've got mostly the sistrum and the this drum down, but they took me way longer than it took other people. But the acapella, it's like I'm still way, way far behind. And I did a 23 and me test. And one of the fucking traits that it came up with, it says less likely to be able to catch a musical pitch. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> Dude, that's so rude. <laughs> it's like one thing to say it, but to actually read somebody actually writing that down on paper hurts way more than anybody saying that, dude. It's just like, oh, let me see what my results are. Boy, yeah, it gave me an excuse. Sand pitch is pretty much what it said. <laughs> Man, literally, I've had so many people try to explain it to me, and I, I still don't know. Like, I feel like I understand, but I don't know. If you could pitch it to the the lame the lamest of the the layest of the laymen, mm -hmm. uh, what is pitch? <laughs> right. 
how oh, how would you me, yeah 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 how would you tell them how would you tell them what is, what is pitch how would you answer that like where do you begin uh this is why i play drums everybody yeah so you know no i'm just kidding um it's you don't have to know the, the music theory as much for drums or I, you you really don't mm -hmm. because it's how i think about it is like you know i think about it this way remember in middle school when you see your friends with the with the pens on both of their sides playing drum beats on mm -hmm. the desk. If you can do yeah. that, you can hit a drum boy. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I feel about it. I think who said it? Talib Kweli said this. If you can talk, you can sing. If you can walk, you can dance. I like you know? that. So it's like, and also like I was telling you before, even before this, like when if you see somebody able to do something that seems impossible, but it's you're seeing it in front of your face and it's physically possible. It's physically possible for you to be able to do the same thing. All it takes is training, dedication, and repetition. It's really, a really any, any sort of skill to me that always come that those three foundations always are the things that you need to achieve what you're trying to achieve. So it's like, um going back to like teaching somebody pitch um how i would do it if you have no sense of pitch don't i don't try to guide them to what they're supposed to like sing or like how you're how you're trained like in a book what i say mm -hmm. is find something that you like and just mimic it you know using auditorial training and line yourself up with that pitch as close as you can. And again, repetition that thing. Do it over and over and over again. Yeah. If they can physically do that, then to me, that's when I can start breaking it down and putting it in a visual aspect and be like, well, this is actually what you're doing. Okay. And if it's too difficult for them to understand the visual aspect, then you keep learning through an auditorial perspective. And you keep showing them what they're capable of doing of what they're actually doing until you can start teaching the concepts of what's in the book with what they're doing. And something in their brain starts to connect the dots together and they'll be like, oh, I do recognize that. Oh, OK, cool. Oh, dang, that's what I'm doing. Or dang, that's what that bird is singing. Like those are the pitches. <whistles> like oh, okay, I know what this interval is now. And it's like, if you connect things that people are already generally surrounding themselves with and what they're already used to, it's easier for them, in my opinion, to comprehend it because it's relatable. And it's something that they're always surrounding themselves by on a daily basis. So it's like, as opposed to telling somebody to do this homework assignment. <laughs> Yeah, hell no. Straight up. Like, who wants to do homework? More times out of 10, nobody wants to do that homework. Nobody is that ambitious to want to learn some things, which is sad, but there are always some, you know, that are just like, oh, you know what I learned today? <laughs> and you're just like, cool, nerd. <laughs> That's tight. <laughs> so, do you want to come over or what? You know, like. <laughs> yeah, the way I've heard people try to explain it before was. They would say just like you're flipping it, so don't flip the melody. And I'd be like, "What does that mean? What does it mean to flip it or reverse it?" Or, you know, those things didn't quite make sense to me. But what you're saying in terms of just listening on repeat and then attempting with repeat mm -hmm. to try a particular or specific melody or or mm -hmm. tune, yeah, that has actually worked for me in the past. I, yeah, I've, I've actually. God, maybe maybe after like a thousand reps, like it's serious reps. It's not like ten reps or twenty reps. Think it's like about, serious reps. But think about big artists who sing or perform and have all these tone deaf fans <laughs> singing the thing back. How else did they do it? They listen to the thing tons of times, and now they're a part of a choir. Like you know what I mean? Like that to me makes so much sense. It's telling people what they can do and what they should do as opposed to telling them what not to do always leads to like negative connotation and so sometimes you overthink that you keep you keep trying to stay away from it and stay away from it and stay away from that but that's actually blocking 
what you're trying to achieve because you keep blocking the 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 cognitive thinking if that makes sense um like in like the fact that somebody is telling you don't flip it and then not really explaining what flip it means all you're doing is jumping you're jumping in a pool of lava and and jumping on chilled rocks making sure you don't slip but He's not telling you which direction to go. He's just like, don't flip. You're just like, okay, well, I don't know where I'm going and doing, but I'm just not flip, you know? Like, <laughs> you, did, you, not, you, didn't, you didn't explain anything, you know? I think, again, um, getting them to do something that they're already used to, and then they can do it, but then they mess it up. That's when you say don't flip, because now you know what not to do when you've already done the thing that you're trying to do. That makes more sense to me. That happened today in my lesson. Um, the guy was playing this groove and he actually kept flipping it. He kept moving where the beat was supposed to land. And I was like, man, you just did this like eight times in a row right there. Like, don't flip it. You know, like stay on the grid, like stay exactly uh, where the groove tells you to sit, you know? So it's like, don't try not to mentally block yourself from like sitting into that, that mental space. And the best way to do that is through repetition is you do it over and over and over again until it feels like you're breathing air, you know, and that's how, like I said, any skill to me is achieved. That's how I got good at that ball in the cup game that I was telling you about earlier. You the know? Kendama. Kendama, dude. Kendama is so fun, man, because it relates. It reminds me and it relates to the trials and tribulations of learning music as well as the trials and tribulation of learning skateboarding and stuff like that at the same time, except I don't get injured. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> you don't pop yourself in the eye or does I it mean, knock your glasses you, off? You've, you've popped yourself. I've, I've done that. I've hit myself on the kneecap or something, but it's like these injuries aren't severe. They're just like, oh, boo -boo. all right, cool. Let's, let's move on. The skateboarding. If you fall on your hands, which I've done. Same. You, you get know, cut up. You get cut up or you bruise your hand. Imagine yeah. bruising your hands as a drummer and then showing up to a rehearsal the next day. You know, and I showed up the next day and I'm just like, guys, I can't play. My hands are bruised. What? Boy, this is your job. Your hands are bruised. <laughs> they go tell home. you to put some gloves on or what yeah just <laughs> go home showers you're out dude like come back when you're ready you know? <laughs> oh man so Sorry. you were talking about a little bit how you were you were given lessons so you proceeded from middle school and high school and then correct me if i'm wrong you you did it at a collegiate level too right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so from middle school was like the entry level high school was the um I think that's the discovery period. I think even with anybody in a high school level, like that's just a whole self-discovery thing. And so for me, musically in high school, I did a lot of marching band stuff. I also did a lot of orchestral music. My mom put me into the LA Youth Orchestra super young oh, um, and saw me playing them timpanis. And she was just like, man, that boy can play them timpanis. You're going to sit on that and you're going to get this classical foundation in your Bone, boy but then for me i saw drumline in middle school and yep. i was like i want to be in the marching band you know like nick cannon yeah and then i was called nick cannon in middle school they'd be like oh look at nick cannon over there playing with his <laughs> <laughs> like gosh darn it mom why'd you put cornrows on my head god damn it <laughs> um but then senior year Right before my senior year, my mom and I were looking into colleges to apply for. And my dad wanted me to go to USC. I was kind of on the fence of going to USC. But then my mom was like, hey, there's this school called Berkeley College of Music. They have a summer percussion program. I might honestly pay for you to go try that out. Not to be confused with the one in the Oakland area. Not, no, not the... Not the North San Fran, UC Berkeley, Berkeley College of Music in Boston, Mass. Um, she just, she paid for it and she basically had me sign up and 
man, this was like the first time in my life where I was just like surrounded by a bunch of people that did didn't want to do anything else but drum. They wanted to eat, yeah. sleep, breathe, fart. You have fellow travelers. Okay. Like you were a little bit of an outsider pariah type. Like you said, you were different. They're they trying to make fun of you, say Nick Cannon, but you're on some different stuff. But now you got fellow travelers. That like are like, everybody around you. Nick Cannon too. I feel you. <laughs> Yes! You know, and like that was also the first time I had been surrounded by a bunch of drummers who were hungry for it. Mm -hmm. You know, like I there were there weren't too many people in my program that were exceptionally hungry for it. They just they love band. They love being in band. They love the vibe of band. And that's cool, too. But when you try to win stuff, I'm like, bro. You need to go home and rep this stuff, man. Like, we got to get this down before comp. And, you know, you, you can't always get everybody on the same page. And it's totally understandable. When I was a kid at that point, I didn't get that. And it used to piss me off and, and man, all sorts of stuff. So when I went to that Berkeley program and saw dudes who were, like, just sitting in the hallway practicing the homework, I was like, oh, dude, let me practice it with you. And then we're all, like, working together to, like, get this foundation down i'm like dude i need to be at this school this is awesome this is also the first time i saw somebody who kicked my ass <laughs> the shit that i wanted to do and we had this class and i'd like show up and i did my assignment it was all right and then this one kid jp dude shout out jp he sits on the kit and he's he just kills the assignment and he goes over and beyond the assignment and we all looked at each other and we we're like damn <laughs> you're just like damn this kid he is set weird. the new bar oh bro this kid was nasty at like 17 dude 16 17 and i'm like dang that was the first time i was scared in my musical journey i was like there's no way i'm ever gonna make it to this point you know i was like there's no way i'm ever gonna make it to this level but then i went back to my senior year in school and that's all i did every single day that was literally i was like my goal is to make it there and so this is the first time this is not the first time this is more because i used to do some like drum corps stuff and more advanced marching stuff and then i did orchestral stuff so i knew what it took to practice but i wanted to go over there to play drum set and i wasn't mm -hmm. a drum set player really at the time i was a percussionist so i was playing all these different drum instruments and this is the first time i was like dude i don't know how to play this thing at all bro i would i would get out of second periods and fourth periods early for nutrition and lunches to run to that band room and practice and then be there after school. and i was doing it pretty much every day every other day to the point where people were like don't you do anything else no like, <laughs> it's my no, craft this is what i want this is what i yeah. what i have to have and then like when people found out i made it to berkeley all those people talking all that shit they're like Oh man, I'm really happy for you. And all I can think about in my head is like, I just want to pimp slap all you guys <laughs> for doubting me and for telling me to shut up and all of this. But I persevered through it. And then on the prestigious level, going to Berkeley, oh man, dude, like that was a whole that's a whole my world just flipped upside down, man. Because that was the first time I left home. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first time I was living on my own, even though I was living in the dorms for the first two to three years. But still, it's like, there's no parents. There's no, like, curfew that come home. It's like, yep. you're on your own. Physical you know? climate difference, Boston, oh Mass, God, way different than than San Fernando Valley where we grew up. Yeah, where it's just like people people are jealous of how not cold the winters get over here. But for us, like, cold is cold. And then I had my first snowstorm bro i called everybody i called my mom i called my dad i called my bro i called my old band teacher at the time and i was like get me out of here it's so cold and i i thought snow was gonna be fun fuck this man i can't do it <laughs> it changed it made me it made me had to perceive proceed my life in a way where it's just like all right like you you're kind of slightly bitching out on some of this do you how bad do you want this and so you know i think the lessons that i learned in the prestigious level were stuff that i still take to this day um you know 
I had professors that just really kicked my butt getting me to learn things because I thought I was hot shit when I was in high school. And then I remember a, a teacher would just be like, okay, here's the homework assignment. Come back next week. Come back next week. Um, I'm basically playing over everything. You still there? Hand up. Oh, no. Oh, no. There he yeah. is. There he is. There he is. See, you said I, a teacher what, used to be like what? Oh, uh, the teacher, I played, I had this homework assignment playing a, a thing, and I, I wasn't playing with no pocket. I wasn't playing a no groove. I was just like slamming the hell out of the kit. And he goes, and excuse my friend, but he goes, do you think anybody gives a fuck about your little Blair solo? You think anybody cares? You think when you go up and you play with these other musicians, do you think they want to hear you play over them solos and you won't give them a chance to sing? Like, and he had this concept. I don't want to. I don't want to say it. It's a little vulgar. I'm not even gonna say it. But uh -huh. he had this concept, and bro, this guy put me to tears. Wow. I was crying in the middle of my private lesson in college, yeah. and he's just like, "Why? <laughs> Who wasn't in seeing? Why are you crying?" And I'm like, "Nobody has ever like told me this kind of thing in this way. Like, no one's ever like." put their foot down and tell me like shut the fuck up and let other musicians play in this ensemble that you're in like it's not all about you it's about everybody that you're playing with as a unit you're providing a listening environment for everybody you're not just providing a listening environment so everybody can hear you play yeah you know and a lot of stuff like that taught me a lot uh, like so many concepts of music, but at the same time, life. And that's why the prestigious level is such a beneficial way of continuing to study music, man. Because it's like, then you're going to college while you have a nine to five. And you still got to do, you still got to practice your homework assignments or like do your, your music theory assignments. And you still have to show up and make sure that that stuff is on time. And some days and some assignments you don't get them on time and some of them that you do. And it's just like, man, it's like, it's such a interesting pre-life experience to go through that. It's like, this is what you want to do musically, like these roadblocks are going to be in your way as well, but you are still going to have to trample through that snow. You know, you are still going to have to make do with what's due. Cause otherwise you just, you, you're going to get eaten alive, boy. You're going to get eaten alive. You know? Um, so that's, that's like with me rambling as much as I did. Um, that's a, from, foundational beginning of time until mm -hmm. college of my musical experiences um i i i wanted it man i wanted to do music really bad and then once i got thrown in the fire in college i was just like oh crap this is actually testing my willpower dude you know it just completely changed from like this is what i've always wanted to do to I know this is what I want to do. And there's nothing else that's stopping me from making this a reality at that point, you know? So yeah, dude. That was beautiful. Yeah, you're passion you're you were passionate about it. You dedicated like all that time. It was, you know, like almost single mindedly. Like I don't know if you ever saw the the sushi documentary on Netflix where they introduced the mm -hmm. term, you know, shokunin. It's one of those Japanese words that just means like a, a artisan or a craftsman right. who just focuses on one thing as a, the opposite of a jack of all trades mm -hmm. and someone who kind of narrows in and, and specializes like, but, but even within that, you know, that's not a full description because it's like you had percussion instruments, but also you're moving and transitioning into, into drumming and drum sets. Like, so even, even there, it's not like you were so narrow in the specialization, but it's it's beautiful to see that. And then off camera, you and I were talking. I was actually uh, been a, a sub this past year, so it's funny that you were telling me that you were you were working around some subs and working mm -hmm. on the schools. 
And one of the ideas I've, I've brought up a couple of times actually on this program is I'm a big fan of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who's this probabilist and this thinker. And he, he always talks about people who are anti-fragile, who are right. those who gain from disorder. Like right. there are the fragile people get worse off when there's disorder or chaos. The robust just survive, but the anti-fragile, they thrive. And it sounds like you're thriving on a new venture where you actually – you know, selling your own services and, and, and getting hired on the fly, doing private lessons, like, like it's full circle. Cause this, what you got when you were a kid. Right. Yeah. There's like, there's like that little, um, inside feeling in my heart and gut that like has always wanted to give back, you know, who's always wanted to teach. And because I was taught by such great people being brought up, I just always felt like, you know, if anybody's going to get into this, that I want them to actually be taught with a hundred percent passion and a hundred percent charismaticism, you know, because it's so easy to not want to learn something from just having a bad teacher. You yeah. know, who just I, does. Who just I does. turned myself away from math because of one teacher in high school, oh, and I was a math guy my whole life. One teacher turned Girl, me away from it. I remember that. Are you serious? 100%. Dang. 100%. And then my bad relationship with that one teacher affected me in physics. I got an A in physics and I tried going to AP physics mm -hmm. and I was denied AP physics, not because of my physics grade, but because of my pre-calculus grade, oh. which, which I got a bad grade because I stopped giving an F right. because of the poor relationship mm -hmm. with a, a teacher that I had. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's really easy for that to happen. I've seen and I've seen people who are starting to get into it and just be like, nah, like I'm good. I'm just like, what? But you were doing so good. And they're just like, nah, I'm just I'm just not feeling it. And like just a small portion of those people just had a bad teacher that irritated them or made them feel like crap. And they were just like, I don't need this. And I'm like, bro, that's not everybody, you know? This is one dude. This is one guy. But you start off with a really good teacher and is just able to give you foundation in such a insightful way, but also like uh, enforcing positive reinforcement within you, even if you're not doing it right. I think that's very important if you're going to teach somebody, even if they're doing it wrong, like little white lie, you're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> but that gives them the strive to be like, well, he says I'm doing great. So I'm just going to keep going. That's the, that's what, that's yeah. why we want you to keep doing it. It's like, we want you to keep going, even if you're doing it wrong. Cause by the time we want to explain things, that's when we tell you what you're doing wrong. But if you cut somebody off through that kinesthetic learning, like th th that, that thing inside their head is not going to click. So they got to keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going and trial and error and trial and error. And eventually Maybe I take like a small like minute nap and then I wake up and all of a sudden this kid is just like grooving. I'm like, wait, what? The heck? How did you do that? It's like, well, Blair, you made me do it a hundred times. Like, that's right. <laughs> yeah. You gave him the confidence. Martial arts instructors, I've seen them do that and I've heard of them do that all the time. Sometimes that white lie borders on like a, a damn lie. You know what I mean? Like sometimes, <laughs> so, sometimes they push it. I've seen them fake it a little bit too much where it's a little cheesy, you know? <laughs> Uh, where it's like, you know, damn well, that was not a good move. Yeah. But uh, but I, I, I understand what you mean. I think there's a certain category of person, maybe people like me and you, who would be gritty. And um, me, I almost prefer somebody to berate me. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, me too. Um, but for the masses, for most people, mm -hmm. I think what you said is absolutely like I've seen it been effective. Like you yeah. just encourage them. A little bit and i i do some language instruction like i've taught people you know the ethiopian alphabet and things like that so i've i've seen that like the different character of the person um and it's it so funny that when, it, when you said so that because i've seen that dude it's so intriguing to like watch the brain work in that type of situation too and that's 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 like the cynical side of me when i'm like hey man you messing up, bro, and you're messing it up for everybody. And in the back of my head, my head's just like, all right, let's see what happens. Let's see how he responds to that. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but it's like that's the test. It's like, all right, is he gonna cry about it? Is he gonna give up, or is he just gonna be like, you know what? Screw you, Blair. I got this. Like, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for same. That. Those are my favorite because because yeah. those are the ones. It's hard to even say you're teaching them. You're guiding them. Yeah, so that exactly. they can guide themselves. Like, shoot, they're you know? teaching you. <laughs> they're teaching you. It's like, oh, dang. Like, especially when they start giving you insight on the way that they're learning something. And you go, boy, what kind of spinach are you eating, dude? Like, I didn't <sighs> even think about that. That's crazy. Yeah. Whatever you just said, keep going. And I go home and be like, dang, man. Like, that, that shit Max said is actually, like, on something man like oh crap i've had that happen to me you know speaking of max um this goes to a, another type of of student the cocky bastard <laughs> the cocky bastard the one who is good but is just overconfident about it and i can admit that i've been there too but man mm -hmm. that is one story dude <laughs> I was uh, I was a part of this summer program, and we were basically teaching um, kids who are in band like how to be in an orchestra. Basically, we were like prepping them up for an orchestral concert, but they were all like high school concert band kids, mm -hmm. and so they were. It's really hard to be like, "Hey, you guys interested in playing orchestra?" I'm like, "Orchestra? What? What are you talking yeah. about?" I'm, like, I'm trying to march on this field, dog. I'm like, "No, like orchestra is some real." ish man like orchestra's real like if you can get if you can get a foundation on this dude this thing will take you a long way and i had boys in college even not at like a special music school like you who did you know orchestra and opera and it paid for their college yep yep it's it's it, and it's dude that kind of music is never gonna die like my mom always says it's like there's always a market in it that is like an like a quote-unquote ancient style of music that will continue to keep being played because people will pay for that to be there the people will pay to see and experience that because you're experiencing a part of history that you were never in per se in that era and that's very special to a lot of people um that's one way of thinking it but um so we're playing this aaron copeland piece and this cocky uh, horn player at the time. I'm not going to say his name, even though I already said it in the beginning, so if you really want to know, just go back in the video. But, um, <laughs> yo, he was coming up and there's like a solo six, and he's like, yo, that's mine. And I'm like, well, hold up, little dude. Like, there are all these other players that have an opportunity to do it. And he's like, no. That's mine. Like, I'm going to have this part. And so we rehearse it. Rehearse it, rehearse it. And he gets it down, so I'm like, okay. I'll consider. And one thing he doesn't get it down, I'm like, hey man, your part's about to get stolen if you don't practice this piece. Let him know. And, and then that put some fire in his behind. So then he came back, he came back strong, he had it down. I was like, all right, the part's yours. We play the concert. Dude's a little bit too overconfident. Plays the solo. Gets to the last line of the solo and he goes in front of all the people who were in the audience and everybody looked and was just like oh but then i was just i was conducting at the time so i was just like hey man you win some you lose some music gotta keep going on we're only two and a half minutes in this piece we still got seven minutes of this piece like i'm not done here but i can see in his eyes how defeated that made him he was humbled. He was humbled by it. It was the... I started crying seeing him humbled and pissed and mad at himself for not having that. And it was inspiring to me to be like, that happened to me when that private teacher kicked my ass. It's the same feeling. It's like, I came out guns blazing and this kid was just like, I'm coming out guns blazing. This is what happens when I put too much out there and I'm not focused on what the task at hand is. And he was humbled by that. And ever since then, it has made him such an even greater and more phenomenal trumpet player because he understands that concept of like, 
hey, man, if you even screw up once or twice, I'm going to go home and work that thing to the grindstone and come back and make sure I have it down. So, Like it's not just about being competent. It's about being so excellent that it's muscle memory. Like you're not even conscious. You're, You're in a flow state. Absolutely. It's crazy, man. Teaching, teaching will, teaching will do that to you. Teaching will do that to peeps. You know, like it will help you understand so many things outside of just the subject matter that you're teaching, and just like the, the, um, just the way people perceive life and the way they think about going about their every day. You know, and it's just through like just educating whatever subject matter that you're at. That's why I love it so much as well, because it goes beyond just music, you know, it goes so far and it gives me joy. It gives me joy, man. And I love that it's been giving you joy and, and practical lessons on, on life. This is great, man. We're, we're going to have to have you on again for a round two pretty soon. I'm super down, man. This is, this was awesome. It was super awesome. You, man it's so good to see you man like 